So Rata, I had a question um, that in the process of uh, self-assessment and deciding what's good for me, um, I mean, I've done this about like three or four times in my life. Uh, the first time around, I went to group therapy and then discovered that that's not the place for me. And it took me about two months to realize that I need to go to a one-on-one session. Actually, it was on me, but the psychiatrist at that time who, dis- who decided that, no, I mean, it's like I require individual therapy. Uh, the second time around, I started with a form which I wasn't even sure if it was right for me. And I don't even I don't even know what that, you know, sort of uh, school of uh, counseling was. And I think for two years, I kept feeling like I'm going two steps backwards until I finally discovered someone who was practicing CBT. Um, I don't really, I mean, I don't know how to frame this question, but I'm sort of wondering, and you did point out this in the set, in the, um, in the slides where you talked about, you know, that if I feel miserable, do I need to take stock? But I'm wondering, like, are there sort of parameters or criteria that could help you to do a self-assessment better? Or if there is also this sort of uh, coincidence that happens? Do you mean an assessment of how therapy is going? Or do you mean an assessment of how at the start, No, so at the start, if I know that, okay, I want to go for therapy, but mm-hmm. I don't know, like, you know, what is the the school of thought that I really want to choose or, you know, what is the approach I want the counselor to take? Uh, I don't know if one can do that self-assessment by themselves or it's just that you go via referrals and discover that this is the right person for you or this is not the right person for you. Okay. Uh, See, to some extent, there is a little bit of that. Some types of problems are better dealt with, with some modalities kind of thing. Um, so, but I think that this approach, it depends a little bit more on which, which way of looking at human beings resonates with you. You know, uh, for instance, I, so let's say I see myself as a fairly cognitive person that for me to follow something, it needs to make sense to me. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I like things kind of logical and organized and ordered and I'm looking for that kind of structure and organization in my life, then CBT may be more suitable. Um, if what I want is maybe more to be able to sit back and explore or become aware of bits of myself which I'm not aware of otherwise. And I'm saying I know that things are not okay, but I can't completely describe why they are not okay, then um, a dynamic therapy might be more useful. So, and of course, if you have a relationship problem, then systemic becomes kind of straightforward. Um, But uh, yeah, so all forms of therapy and all forms, and most therapists can deal with most types of issues. Perhaps the only distinction I would kind of really make is if there is a psychiatric condition as well, then somebody who has training in uh, psychiatric conditions, like a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist, might be uh, more useful. Um, Otherwise, I think it really depends so much on the quality of the professional uh, who you're meeting uh, rather than any big external uh, guideline. Right. So I think that was the one affirmation I was seeking that eventually it doesn't matter who you are, who you are seeing. Uh, no, not really, because, you know, while I'm saying that you, if you have a psychiatric issue, see a, a, a clinical psychologist. I know several counselors who I'll happily refer clients to depression with because I know they know how to uh, deal with it. Right. So it, it is, I think, quite individual in that sense. Mm, okay. And what is the sort of uh, uh, line in terms of uh, when, you know, you just have to kind of follow the medical advice uh, instead of choosing for yourself? Like I know uh, there have been instances in my life where I've been told, you know, why don't you go ahead and take an antidepressant? And I've resisted that most often because of the fear that um, I don't want to be addicted to these. Uh, Mm -hmm. But 
<laughs> I've always drawn that line for myself um, because that's the willpower I bring to myself. But I don't know at what point for an average individual, this line, you know, where, how is this line decided if it's decided? Yeah. Okay. Now, the ultimate decision of whether you will be benefited by medication or not, from the professional standpoint, is taken by psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are the people who do the diagnosis and being the doctors, of course, they're the only people who can actually prescribe. No one who is not a psychiatrist, if you're not a psychiatrist, you're not allowed to prescribe. Um, and there are certain markers in terms of your functionality, in terms of the symptoms that you're showing uh, that will help a psychiatrist kind of... Um, uh, take that call. Yeah, I do find that uh, with many conditions, like with a psychotic disorder, which is a major mental disorder where you don't have contact with reality, in general, we would suggest medications as being useful. But with Depression, anxiety, these things which kind of fall more within the normal range of experience, we often leave it to the clients to decide. And uh, I many times spend several sessions with clients look, talking about medication, looking at pros and cons, uh, helping them to weigh and make that decision and helping them to figure out okay, even if I start medicine, then, you know, how can I do it in such a way that is uh, effective for me? Um, at the end of the day, you will do something or continue to do something if it's working. Right? And so I've had clients who resisted taking medication for several years, finally taken it, and then come and said, oh my God, why did I not do this before? This is, my life is so much better now. And I've also had clients who um, have been on medication or tried medication and found it's not really making any big difference to their lives. So I think again that there's quite a bit of individual variation in these. And, uh, you know, what I might say to clients who are thinking about this is that it's a two-month trial. You can try it. If it works, you continue. If it doesn't, you can always stop. And um, just one last uh, response. Since you mentioned it, psychiatric medications are not addictive. In fact, we are careful uh, that they are not addictive. Um, and so that is something, except for benzodiazepines, sleeping tablets, one set of it, which is not really even prescribed very much these days. Nothing else is actually addictive. So that's not something that you need to uh, worry about. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that misconception. I think I've seen a couple of cases where uh, I've, had, I've had very close friends who've been on... Um, I, uh, yeah, and I've had... Uh, I've actually seen a case of somebody who forgot to carry her medication, was going for her field work to a village, and then suddenly decided she's not going to board the train because she doesn't have her medication. And mm -hmm. I'm not going. And I was like, oh my God, I never want to be in this situation. <laughs> I don't know, I ever want to see that I don't have a life without my medicine. <laughs> see, I think that a better uh, analogy or parallel for psychiatric medications two drugs, recreational drugs, which you can get dependent on, is stuff like insulin or blood pressure medicine. Basically, you know, there are, uh, there is a biological component to this as well. And you can have um, neurotransmitter disturbances, etc. And you need that medicine to keep that in check. So that you can be free to kind of do the therapy and explore the other things that you need to. And yes, there are clients who as long as, you know, as long as I'm taking my insulin, my sugar is fine. As long as I'm taking my antidepressant, I'm okay. 
that can happen. Thanks. Thanks. This was quite useful. I have two other quick questions since there are none uh, so far. Um, one is regarding uh, what is your personal take on the relationship between diet and mental health? And I'm asking this because there was a time when I was having serious sleep disorders. And uh, one of the advice given to me at that time was that maybe try a low carbohydrate diet uh, to figure things out. And uh, again, I feel like I'm either too self analytical or maybe I'm an edge case where I then discovered as a result of switching to that diet that the salt is usually a trigger for me to get very anxious and that there's this sort of reinforcement cycle between eating salty snacks and getting on a high and then you know eating the salty snacks to get on the high again so that cycle keeps going. Mm, mm. So um, I, I mean I was just curious to know if you had a take on this and if you don't have one then obviously you could sort of say that yeah. uh, and mm. then I'll, I'll ask my last question after this. Okay. Okay. I think definitely this whole awareness of nutrition and how it impacts our uh, physical as well as mental health, it's really kind of taken off in the last few years. And a lot of the initial research definitely seems to be promising. As a clinician, I can tell you that like the story you told me about the salt, I've heard several stories uh, about how stopping sugar made me feel much less depressed or shifting, you know, eating healthier means that I wasn't waking up as much in the middle of the night because my stomach was full. Uh, there are also, you know, uh, theories of uh, like pineapples, I think there are foods which have antidepressant properties or foods which are supposed to calm you down. At the moment, the research on this is not really like um, conclusive. It's more like it's beginning. So this is something which I would sort of say definitely as a therapist, I would keep my eye on. As a client, I would suggest that Everyone keeps their eye on. Um, but at the moment, it's more often experiences where you experiment with yourself and you just figure out, okay, I function better uh, in, in this particular mode. Right. So uh, my last question, and maybe we could then conclude. Um, <laughs> the statement is being made so often that today's times are unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that you can't really compare what you're going through right now with, uh, you know, what, like you, you simply have no benchmark to compare what you're going through mm -hmm. right now. Uh, so I wanted to understand your take on this statement. These are unprecedented times. What does it mean? Because for some of us, we've not internalized this statement, but you keep hearing it just as you keep hearing the statement. Am I audible on? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, uh, so I think uh, your take on the statement that these are unprecedented times and therefore, uh, you know, your, uh, your advice or your sort of personal perspective on how should we look at ourselves and the vulnerabilities that we feel currently uh, and whether it really makes sense to say that there is really no comparison to what's happening right now. Is that how we need to look at it? Okay. Okay. Um... I think unprecedented in the sense, okay, I don't think there was anyone who expected that the world will just shut down for 2020. Uh, this kind of physical restriction on our movements, on our... Um, our, our, just our basic sense of freedom or agency or, or, or getting things done. This everyone in the family actually being stuck at home. Um, this has not happened for centuries. Uh, and so it is, I think, for everyone a fairly new experience. In our lifetimes also, we are used to thinking of, you know, human beings and science as being on top of everything and viruses and all can come and go. But I think, again, we're kind of seeing that uh, 
were not as much on top of things as we might have hoped to have been. So is this an experience which hasn't really happened before? I won't say it's never happened before, but it is definitely, definitely unusual. Uh, how do we respond to it? Initially, I think I saw a lot of, you know, there was that immediate reaction either of a lot of anxiety or kind of a feeling quite relieved to have some breathing space and say, I don't have to go to work for two months, it's not so bad. Um, now I'm finding that more and more people are dealing with other collateral fallout of this, of, of losing their job or of saying, okay, it's not like I don't have house help for two weeks, I don't have house help for the rest of the year. We have to change the way in which we do things at home. Uh, my income, which used to be so much, has dropped down to so much, and I don't know when it will increase again. Um, so I think that there are all these collateral things also which people are dealing with. Um, how should we respond to it? See, one thing I think is that as human beings are quite adaptable and you know we respond to all kinds of different circumstances and we change and we adjust to them and I think we will change and adjust to this as well. I see us doing it in different ways. The first month that I needed to do only online sessions I disliked very much but now I've got used to it because I know that I don't really have options. Psychologically, I think we need to accept uncertainty right now. And that's what I find most difficult for people to do. We need to accept that we don't really know exactly what's happening, or exactly when this will end. We have hopes and we have theories and, um, but we can't really make very huge plans based on that. Um, I find that those who are able to sort of accept the uncertainty, adapt and modify what they are doing in order to, um, what to say, order to respond to the circumstances who've developed their personal relationship with coronavirus. You know, like one person may be like, I'm very, very scared of this and that's my personal relationship. Another person may say, I know what I need to know. Like I've learned that, okay, here I should wash my hands and there I should uh, um, wear a mask. And as long as I follow my protocols, I'm not really bothered about what the virus is doing outside. Um, think about what your personal relationship with this virus is and think about whether that makes sense to you or whether it's something you want to modify. I'm not sure if that addressed all parts of your question because it was quite a few things. So if there's anything else, just let me know. I think there was this one statement you made which was I think quite spot on for me. I don't know about the others, but the feeling of like I was on top of things earlier, things were under my control but that's not the case anymore right now uh, mm -hmm. and i think that uh, you know just that statement really nailed it for me because that's the kind of person i have been and now to kind of you know accept that can i always be on top of things even if there's uncertainty i think maybe that pushiness is something that that could uh, that could be made i don't know like what's the right word but i think maybe that uh, that feeling of trying to be in control and this desire to be in control, maybe that could be let go of. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yes, because I think uh, definitely, and control is what I was thinking of when you were speaking as well. Um, those of us who like to, to know and predict and ha you know, have this overview and be in control of what happens, we're finding it much, much harder uh, to really deal with the fact that 
right now there isn't there's very little you can do to control things great so i think maybe that's a good note to end oh okay there's a question here which is does burnout need therapy <laughs> Abhishek Mishra is asking if burnout needs therapy. Abhishek, if you would like to uh, speak your question, let us know. I can unmute you. But Ratna, please go ahead. Um, could you tell me what you mean by burnout? Um, yeah, let me unmute Abhishek. Uh, Amok, can you unmute Abhishek? Because I'm not able to. Ah, okay. Uh, Abhishek, you can speak your question. You're, you're unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is related to actually work burnout because uh, I have seen there is a very slight difference between actually going to a depression and then the burnout. This is my personal experience. It's not with respect to anyone else. So I, I, I had like a very similar experience. Probably there will be very little bit difference. So, but when I was in depression, I did not go through a therapy and all, but I just managed it somehow. But same, but same sort of scenario is happening with me when I'm going through the work burnout. Okay. So it's like a stress, anxiety, and a lot, lot of things. Okay. Okay. Now, burnout is actually the name for the psychological distress that you feel as a result of work. And so depression and anxiety are actually the common forms in which burnout manifests. <laughs> A sense of hopelessness, a sense of sort of loss of meaning in work, not being able to control, not feeling very motivated. Many of the features of burnout are uh, actually very similar uh, to depression. And so in that sense, I'd say, yes, there's no question that burnout uh, therapy can help with burnout. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, thanks. I don't have like further questions. I'm still figuring out. Uh, yeah. Because okay. some of some of my friends suggested, you know, you should talk to this psychiatrist and also, but I am not pretty convinced about that because uh, as I actually I see Zainab and mentioned like it's also because of exhaustion. So probably I should also put some restrictions around my work. <laughs> and see, like I, um, like I put earlier in the slide, when you notice a problem with yourself, I think, you know, you, you do need to kind of look around at your life and your environment and see if you can understand uh, where that problem is coming from. And if that problem is coming from, for instance, you're saying I'm too tired because I have too much work to do and not enough hours to do it. Uh, that circumstance is something that needs to change. If you did seek therapy, your therapist will actually be helping you to figure out what are all these things in your environment which you need to change and helping you to make plans or strategies to change them as well. So <clears throat> this is not necessarily mutually exclusive uh, territory. You can do it on your own, like I said, you can do it with the help of a self-help book, you can do it with the help of friends and family, or you can do it with the help of a therapist. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ratna, for doing this. I know that this has been a lot of effort, including yesterday's rehearsal and then revamping the presentation. I uh, sincerely hope everybody enjoyed the session. And if uh, any of you have topics that you'd like, uh, Kilter, which is the organization that has... Uh, oh, there is a question here. Let me see. Um, uh, there's Yogita is asking a question saying, how do you have the difficult discussion with someone who you think needs to see a therapist, but they don't see it? Uh, Yogita, you can also feel free to ask your question. We can unmute you. Um, Ratna, did you capture the question? Yeah, yeah, I got the question. And I think it's a very good question. Um, because invariably, if you say to someone, maybe you need to see a therapist, the implication is, do you think I'm mad? Like, you think there's something wrong with my head? Um, and it feels like an accusation or it feels like a criticism. 
if you say you need to see a therapist because we often also use that no and when we're frustrated with people we say yeah you go get help kind of thing um and so yes it is a difficult discussion to have uh yogita but i'd suggest that you start with looking or getting the person to talk about what are your experiences what are you struggling with what are you doing to help yourself where is this working and where is this not and then it's a good point to say look you've tried all this and so much has worked but you're still stuck here so why don't you go and see a professional who might be able to help you with this um and maybe that will help uh, yogita would you like to uh, ask a further question to ratna okay yogita seems to say okay uh yogita you're on you're unmuted so you could uh, continue to ask a question if you have a question or if you want to share something okay okay yogita is still muted uh amok would you be able to unmute yogita once again uh, sorry technology is not very great sometimes <laughs> so um i don't know if i can be heard but the question yes. is more related to someone who is probably closer to their 70s and they've had years and years of layers of stuff form um over their personal experiences or it has molded who they are and um you tell them and at some level they agree that yes of course i need to see someone but they don't do anything about it so i was just trying to figure out um how do you sort of either you take charge and you get them to do it you sit through the first session with them or i don't know it's it's something that is um something oh, that yeah uh, it's it's hard yeah i i think very often it is uh, you know especially with okay, i won't say especially with older people but yes there are some people who may feel I, i it sounds like a good idea but i'm not too sure whether i want to do it the idea of sitting down and talking to a stranger can feel quite uncomfortable mm. depending on your your cultural background and kind of how you're made up as well it can be useful to you know if you have that initial discussion and they say yeah it looks like i do need help um maybe what you could do is to say okay i'll help you to find someone i'll fix the appointment for you and as you said i will bring you i'll take you for the first session whether you sit inside with them or whether you just get them there and wait outside and at least you've got them to the point where they've tried it once they've tried it of course they will decide okay i will do more of this or i will not do more of this and you may not really be able to help uh, that part of it but often you know there is a certain sense of inertia with with getting things started and when when you are distressed or when you are depressed that inertia is greater and as a friend or as a family member if you can help by doing the organizing and the leg work it can actually be quite nice it's quite okay. useful okay that's helpful thanks yeah okay great uh, i think it's 8:03 uh, if there are no more questions let me just hop on to youtube once are there are no more questions then i think we can call this a uh, wrap uh, like i mentioned uh, uh, if you have topics that you'd like kilter who's the organization that is hosting sessions on mental health on fitness on habit on food science etc uh, please do write to us on editorial at hasgeek.com or better still go to hasgeek.com/kilter and uh, you will see uh, uh, places where you can leave comments you can leave ideas for topics uh, we'd be very happy to help because the whole idea is that these are unprecedented times and i am audible <laughs> 
uh, and uh, i think we're all in this together so uh, maybe let's just make uh, you know um, a good company together and uh, go through this together so on that note um, have a good weekend uh, stay relaxed and uh, be gentle on yourself thank you ratna okay thank you all right bye bye bye